Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tuesday Night Advanced Lecture. This is the month of September 2016. And in our advanced class, we talk about one subject every month in great depth. The subject this month is top 10 openings for white and black. We went over a few of them last week. <coughs> I want to show you a game against a master that I had in Texas Championship in 1990. His name is Andrew Smith. And he pretty much, even though he was a master, he violated many of the opening principles. So he got way behind in development. His king side never got developed. He never got a chance to castle. And he lost a very quick game. So I was white. <coughs> I opened with knight f3. A flexible move in the opening, as opposed to e4 and d4. You don't show your hand as to which pawns you're going to put in the center of squares and which squares. And for the same reason, that's a good flexible move for white. Knight f6 is also a good flexible move for black. <coughs> g3. So it's too early to name this opening. Basically, white is trying to fiancho to the bishop and decide which kind of central pawn formation he wants to have. Black played c5. So far, he's playing perfectly fine. These could be the moves of a grandmaster in this opening. Bishop g2, knight c6. Castles, d5. It's still too early to name this opening. If white wants to play reverse Gronfeld, he should play d4 now. If Gronfeld is already a good viable system for black to play, it must be even better as white with an extra tempo. Another setup that White could have chosen was d3, knight d2, and e4. What's the name of this opening? King's Indian attack. So here, I had seen some games from Grandmaster Petrosian, world champion, former world champion, and in situations like this many times towards his mature years. He played reverse Gronfeld and he won many games quickly. So I was hoping for one of those myself here. So I played d4. And black could take, takes, takes, e5, knight takes, pawn takes. So as you see, black has an imposing center, controlling and uh, occupying. But for the rest of the game, white bombard black with this focal point, c4, with the idea of queen a4, with the idea of rook d1. And something like this happens in this game. So, but instead, black played a little bit differently here. When I played d4, he played bishop f5. So with this move, basically black is hoping to play e6 next, have the light square bishop outside the light square pawn chain and basically left with another good bishop and finishes development. However, if it were so easy in queen pawn openings to get your light square bishop out, everybody in the world would have played this. But there is a reason people don't do this and intentionally lock in that bishop with e6, which would have been a better move. So this guy, uh, he basically, he's already at a book. He does not know what he's doing. One of the best ways <coughs> to, to deal with early bishop f5 by black is to hit on b7 pawn. So in order to do that, I need to push my c pawn to get the queen out. So we have uh, symmetrical pawns in the center. And again, best move for him would have been e6. In that case, I have several good choices. Pawn takes is good. Queen b3 immediately is good. But instead, he played d takes c4. So why to play? I was intending to play bishop queen b3. I don't have that now. So queen a4 is the next best thing. If black plays c takes d4, white has an exclam move. Anybody has any idea what that move is? It didn't happen in the game, but had he played 
CD4, white would have had an X clam. Knight takes D4. And if queen takes, bishop takes C6. His best move is bishop D7 and then rook D1 X clam. White is better. All the opening books, they'll tell you that white is, stands better. But when I played queen A4, he played queen D7. So it seems that he's trying to solve all his problems immediately. He got the light square bishop out. He got the queen off the back rank. And looks like he's fine with the openings. <clears throat> so white to play now. I could take this pawn, but then he will have a couple of good continuations, including c takes d4. So I took the c5 pawn now. And I'm threatening to take the c4 pawn next, and I'm holding on to an extra pawn on c5. And I assess the position here as a slightly better for white. So how can he hold on to this pawn? It's not so easy. Bishop e6 would fail several different ways. One is rook d1 immediately on the queen. I can play knight g5 anytime. So there are several options. <coughs> but black played rook d8. So black has fully developed the queen side. But in most openings, you want to put your king to safety first and then pay attention to the queen side, even though there are exceptions like friend's defense, that you fully develop the queen side and then pay attention to the king side. But in most of the queen pawn openings, black is better off castling first. So let's see what happens. Of course, the point of rook d8 is to prevent rook d1 of mine. So white to play. There's no rush in taking this pawn. It's not gonna escape. Nice c3 with the idea of rook d1 now. It's black to play, and this would have been high time for him to finish up his development. E6. E6 would have been reasonable, and I would have taken this pawn. And white is still a solid pawn ahead. Black has no compensations for it. But instead, he played knight e4. <coughs> okay. At first, it looks like another innocent looking move. But this move is a violation of the opening. This knight, he moved this knight twice. He's hoping that I would take, and then he put the bishop in a good diagonal. But here, my focus is to, of course, another point of knight e4 is to capture on c5. So here, I simply defended, defended the c5 pawn and developed my bishop. So all of my miners are out, but he's still stuck over here. So he neglected his kingside development even more. He traded on c3. So here's a knight that moved how many times? One, two, three, four. One, two, three times, and got it traded with a knight of mine that moved only once. He lost two tempi. So this whole idea of knight here, knight takes, was a waste. He's way behind in development. His kingside is still not developed. He needs at least to push this pawn, get the bishop out, and then be able to castle. But white is already controlling so many squares. So again, e6 would have been the better move. Instead, he played bishop e4. So now he will come under a lot of attack because of white's lead in development. Simple moves, you just, I didn't do anything extraordinary. This pawn is mine, I could take it any time, but I figured no rush. So I play rook fd1, and he played queen f5. <coughs> okay. It's white to play. There are many tempting moves. Rook takes rook. He has to take with the king, and he already loses the castle in privilege. It's very tempting. But the more I studied this position, the more I felt like I should go for checkmate. I mean, if I drop a knight on c7, in Buckhouse, I said checkmate, right? So I'm trying to get this knight to go to c7. So I need that rook over there. Knight d4, x clan. More mileage out of his queen. And of course, he saved the queen by queen g6. 
looks like a good safer square. These bishops can be traded anytime, but I didn't want to improve his queen position by moving it here by trading. I want him to trade. So I played <coughs> knight b5 with a checkmating one coming all of a sudden. <laughs> well, now he's missing his queen on this side of the board to defend that square. So black to play. He traded rooks. Rook c8 probably would have been better continuation, but even in this line, white still would have been better off. So here he played rook d1. This looks like an innocent trade, equal trade, but what happens as a result of rook takes and rook takes? In effect, his rook on d8 got traded with my rook on a1. And who benefits as a result of this trade? White. Obviously white. Again, made in one is coming. So knight is actually getting to c7. Nothing he can do about it. So what did he do? e5. He's got to find the escape in the square. So his majesty is going to go for a walk now. So I definitely, he was about to play bishop here and walk to f8. So I had to give him this check. To blockade his bishop diagonal and now it's just a matter of getting to the king white to play what should he do do you agree that we have a middle game heavy piece middle game with queens on the board middle game is all about piece optimization you want to improve the position of your pieces you start with the strongest piece and then one at a time improve their position Queen takes pawn I had, but there is, there is no subsequent threat. He tra probably trades bishops, take, king takes, and there's no good continuation with the queen. So I figured, let's get more mileage out of the queen. Now we get into the point of black having only moves. When your opponent is forced, is forced to make one move only, that's a good sign. What's black's only move here? Yes. F6, maybe. yes f6 again still the position looks like he's doing fine i don't have any killer punts here it's white to play and after f6 he created a hole on this square i have the check but he goes to this square or even f7 now queen takes e4 is good because this is a double attack now Threatening mate and the, and the bishop. So what's the only, absolute only move that black has to prevent both threats? Uh, f5. He, he protects the bishop and, oh no, he can't. The rook will take the queen. Ooh. Bishop f5. Bishop f5, yeah. right? With one move, he dealt with both threats. So how can I get to the king? We go after opponent's weakest link. And where is black's weakest link? AB. You can move your knight. So he's a sitting duck here. His king has nowhere to go. His queen doesn't have any good squares to go to. And he has no threat whatsoever. So here, I'll play queen b5. This pawn is weak. And once that pawn goes, there's a deadly discovery. Knight would be hanging. All kinds of problems. It's black to play, and he moved the bishop back. That bishop that he was hoping to get out and finish his development, on move 19, goes right back home. went all the way back home. OK, so here. <coughs> What should white do now? Is it worthwhile to give up your light square bishop for that knight? Pawn has to take, queen takes. Just bishop takes, pawn takes, and then? Queen takes. Queen takes c6. That's the first thing that I looked at. But there was a major flaw with that. Queen. If I do that, I will lose my queen. Bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes, right? 
And what do I do after this check? King g2. Oh, bishop on and e7. bishop b7. Ouch. Mm. Wow. This is not easy to, to see. What about rook d7, though? Is that checkmate? Yeah. Well, okay. It gives you a... F oh, you win the queen back. because it No, it's mate. Three. It's checkmate. Oh, uh, that's right. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> okay, I missed this move during the game. Rook d7. Wow. Is it mate with the, either the queen or the... No, the queen, queen, queen is, is pinned. Oh. But this, this gives... This makes... This makes Nimzowicz principle... Invalidates Nimzowicz principle that he says defensive power of a pinned piece is, is imaginary. Queen. It is not imaginary. Queen is defending the rook. He cannot take it. He could take and say, you can't take me, you're pinned. But it's not true. So I was planning to do that. And he, here, I figured before I do that, I need to play escape in a square, find escape in a square for my king to play h4. And that was so that on that check, I would go to king h2 rather than g2. Well, he missed the whole point of this combination, and he figured, oh, I'm just trying to ram my h1, so let's just stop it right there, like so many times people do. And now, this is here, and now I played bishop takes knight. Yes. Bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes. So, what's my threat here? Do, do I have a threat? Does this mate? No. They get a piece? But it's close. What is Jeez. white's threat? It's very close, but it's still not so easy to do. So black is a stuck basically. It's frozen. So all you have to do is to Hit him with a check. And freeze it. Make sure he can't escape first. Uh. Moves like this. And then this. It's still not easy to mate. Or maybe rook here next, winning the queen. So that's one idea. But here he gave me a check. Maybe he was still hoping for my king g2. But obviously king h2. So with queen gone from here, now there's a queen checkmate. Right? Queen is no longer guarding the e8 pawn. Oh, yeah. So this one uh, as an example of a, another very effective check. So he tried to go for a run. King f7. And notice he doesn't have an immediate threat. So I have a time for a quiet move still. Not, not all my moves have to be with checks. No, queen e8 is not checkmate, but he wins the bishop. Queen e8 check I gave. So g8. King g8. And you just take the bishop. I could take the bishop, but I would rather take this and take the rook next. Ooh. So I'll play rook d8. That bishop is fine, but it's this bishop that I want, threatening check, check. So here, he played bishop g4. So if he wanted to hope for checkmate, he probably could have played bishop b7. But trouble with that move would have been c6. I would have blocked it. So he saw that, he played bishop here. After bishop takes, bishop back, I'm forced made it. Unless I do something quickly. So I'll play queen f8 check. He played king h7. I'll play queen h8 check. You see, you could say he was playing with a rook and a bishop down, because he never used them. King g6. And as I was thinking about my next move, he spoiled all my fun and resigned. <laughs> so here's a master who violates opening principles by seemingly okay moves, but it backfires no matter who you are. If you violate opening principles sooner or later, you're gonna pay the price. Okay, so next game is about beating a master in 17 moves.
I was white in that game also. This, this game is a, against a player named Billy Patterson. He is uh, he's the only person that I know of who made master in his retirement years. Basically, so there's hope? oh yes, there is hope. So you have another 10, 20 years to make it. Basically, he was, he was a lifelong a strong expert and he was never able to go over 2200. But after he retired, he was a single guy. So he played chess 24 seven and he made it. This is, this game was in 1991. So I think he had made it already by six, seven years. He was already master. You know Billy Patterson. He's from Houston, visiting LA. He still plays there, right? On Tuesday, Wednesday nights. He's still active, yeah. So I opened knight f3, my patented first move. He plays c5, perfectly good response. Sometimes white at this point transposes and go plays e4, and it becomes a Sicilian. But I wasn't going to show my hand as to which pawns I'm going to put in the center yet. So I played g3, like last game. He played d5. I played bishop g2. He played knight c6. Again, I went for reversed Gronfeld. I highly recommend, if you are white in this position, at this point, to reverse Gronfeld is a good line. Gronfeld is already a good line for black with a tempo down. So it's great for white with the tempo up. It really helps you. And this is what makes a reverse Gronfeld. This setup is usually what black has in Gronfeld. So I'm playing that setup. Instead of a tempo down, tempo up. So he played correct moves. He played much better moves in this game, not unlike my last opponent. So played e6. That's the correct move. It's very risky to get that light square bishop out. It's going to be really weak in those areas. So I played e6. First things first, if you castle early on, you really save yourself a lot of headache down the road. You never lose a quick game. You, uh, you never get a check at the wrong time. So I castled. Knight f6. These are the moves of a master. You could see a world champion playing these moves. Perfectly fine moves so far. So he came out of the opening just fine. But he also has to understand the underlying ideas behind it. It's not just good enough to memorize some opening moves. C4. So same pawn formation as last game. Symmetrical in the center. White basically must push his C and D pawns if he hoping to get some advantage. So far he's doing everything right. Bishop E7. Knight C3. Castles. So there's no quick win in this game for white. I mean, like last game. But funny thing is, this game lasted shorter than last one. Even though he played the openings perfectly, fine. White to play, C takes D5. You see this exchange quite often in Queen's, Queen's Gambit and in Catalan system that black is playing. This system of black is called Catalan with a bishop on E7, G3 system and bishop E7. This exchange happens quite often. One of the reasons white makes this exchange is that if black takes with a knight, that means black has no pawns in the center. White has several continuations. E4 is perfectly good. If black takes with a pawn, eventually these two pawns get traded and black is going to be left with an IQP, isolated queen pawn. But you allowed his light square bishop out now. By right. That's the disadvantage that white will get. Black's worst piece gets to come out. But you see, this is a permanent weakness, IQP. So even with black bishop out, that's fine. Things are equal in that sense. The only thing that white has for him in this position is that black is going to be having an IQP. <coughs> now played D takes C5. You notice that I made this trade after he's already made bishop E7. So he made a move with the bishop. Now the correct move is for black to play 
Bishop takes c5 and white will continue with bishop g5, hoping to win a pawn, and if not, bishop comes back, or after bishop g5, bishop e6, position is equal according to theory. But here my opponent came up with a new experiment. He played d4. This is a gambit. Because he knows when he's playing d4, he is running into the risk of my knight moving and defending my extra pawn. Now he has to either try to get this pawn back somehow or prove that with quick development he has enough compensation. So he decided to have a quick development, lead in development for that pawn that he sacrificed. So as you see white has no pawns in the center anymore and black's policy now is to control and occupy the center starting with bishop f5. So of course white doesn't want to get behind either bishop f4. The main point of this move is to play rook c1 and try to hold on to this pawn. I'm testing him to see how he can possibly get that pawn back. On bishop f4 he played bishop e4. This is the most ideal square for this bishop. Because this knight is not coming back to the game, so this bishop is unassailable over here. And as soon as I move the knight, he can trade these bishops, which is good for him. So my goal was to hold on to this pawn, rook c1. And he played queen d5. Beautiful centralization of the queen. Of the four central squares, black has occupied three of them. So what could possibly be the point of queen d5? One, you could say he's trying to play rook fd8 next, or rook ad8, and even more centralization, and trying to hold on to this pawn. This pawn is supposed to give white a lot of headache. But first things first, queen d5 is attacking my a2 pawn. Yeah. So b3, A straightforward, simple. And queen really cannot damage me over here. Now I play rook a d8. So who is in control of the center? Black, Black obviously. Uh, but in order to do this, he has to give up a pawn. He gave up this pawn. And now, the reason he lost this game because he did not continue in the spirit of the gambit. Hmm. He decided to get the pawn back. He played after rook a d8, it's white's move. Are you white or black? I'm white. Okay. It's white's move, and I may need to defend this pawn one more time. Because if he plays knight d7, attacking the c5 pawn again three times, I need to defend it three times. You better play a3 with the idea of b4. Right. I could play a3, b4, but uh, instead, I made another more active move. Rook c4. This is, this is it. So the point of rook c4 is I could play queen c1 and defend that pawn one more time. And with queen on c1, I could play b4, defend the pawn with the pawn for good. So that was another point of rook c4 was that if his knight moves now, rook takes d4 is coming. So I play rook c4. And he should have continued in the spirit of the gambit with, say, rook d7 with the idea of doubling rooks. Basically, beautifully centralizing the center. Instead, he decided to get the pawn back with knight d7. So he's attacking the pawn three times. It's defended twice, so I have to defend it one more time. And what's the only move that defends the pawn? One more time. B4. No, B4, he takes the rook. All right, the rook. Queen C1. Three attackers, I have three defenders. He does not have another attacker. So here he got frustrated. And he made a double question mark move. B5. So. Uh, we have another person here who is a better candidate for finding double question mark moves. <laughs> who am I talking about? B5? No, B5 is a good move. 
Mitz, find the double question mark move. The double question mark. Mitz is still the best candidate. I haven't found anybody else yet. <laughs> At first, looks like a good move. Typical of double question mark moves. But the more you look at it, the more you realize, oops, there's a problem with this one. Maybe F5? F5 is a very good move, too. F5 with the idea of bishop F6 would have wow. been a good continuation, by the way. And that would have really tied me up. This has all the hallmarks of a good move trying to trade his IQP and activate even more pieces. But there's a major tactical flaw with this move. Rook takes bishop. What is it? Rook takes bishop. Because then you can move the knight away. Rook takes, queen takes, and then what? Knight to g5. Knight to g5, queen takes pawn. Um. Not so easy. White pushes. If you ever try to t find out what's wrong with pawn moves of the opponents, one thing I usually emphasize is think of the squares that the pawn used to control that is no longer controlling as a result of that pawn push. So, oh, knight to c3. Knight to c3. Oh, knight. Forking both of these and oh. winning a piece. So, knight c3 wins the piece right beautiful time to come back for this knight finally queen moves knight takes bishop or rook takes this would have been the moment of resignation but he was trickier than this he played pawn takes pawn now i can win the queen trouble is after knight takes queen he takes check i take back and he takes so he's got a rook and a knight for the queen, which is almost enough calm. But, but well, he just captured a pawn. Oh. But white doesn't have to go through all that mess. There's a good, simple continuation. Push. Rookie one, I guess. Simple rookie one. Here I remember the principle by Petrosian. When you have a threat and your opponent has a threat, deal with his threat first there I dealt with his threat my offensive position and threat is still there I has to deal with it that was the moment of resignation so he tried to mess up create some accident didn't work now it's gonna be hope and he's got to be careful for example Queen e6 may lose two pieces take and queen f6 fails to this. Loses another piece. So here in this position, black finally resigned. This is, I named this game, beating a master in 17 moves. So beating somebody under 25 moves is a miniature. Under 20 moves is a super miniature. So, Hope you enjoyed the game. We're going to come back in the second session with one of my long games. Thank you very much.